Good morning to the Patriot team of the Elkhorn 7th grade middle school. Uh, my name is Joe Reeder. I wrote Restoration in the Barrens and I want to thank you for giving me a chance to talk with you today, even if it is through video. Apologizing in advance for my really bad ability to edit video. A little cold out here, but we'll get through. I'm going to show you three things. First of all, we've got all the questions that were sent to me. should be on the video that you're watching right now. There's another video showing the prairie burn, similar to what you saw in Restoration. And then an attempt to take you in some of the places that um, you hear about in the book. Unfortunately, the steps at Rocher Cree are all dilapidated in need of repair, so the shots you see from Rocher Cree are from the ground. Someday we'll get you up to the top. Let's take a look at the questions. Hi there. Erica wanted to know what it is that inspired me to write the book. Mostly I wanted kids to learn about an ecosystem that I spent a lot of time with and really enjoy, and I didn't want it to sound like a textbook. Uh -huh. That's the short story. Alexis asks, is, is the story based on a true story or true events? Well, the answer is yes and no. Uh, my parents are very much alive, and yet many of the things that take place in the book I write from experience, take a little bit of liberty and enhance them, maybe twist them the way I want them to be. It's kind of a powerful feeling being a writer. You get to do things that they don't let you do in the real world. Jamie asked, how come I made Mr. Kulix so mean? First of all, I named him after a mosquito, and that's kind of an awful thing to do. Mr. Kulix is everything about me that I don't like. Um, it's me when I'm having a bad day. It's every teacher I know who has a bad day. Um, I don't know any teacher who is Mr. Kulix all the time, but every now and then we have a little bit of Mr. Kulix in, in all of us. Kyle wanted to know how the Mary G. Lincoln wildlife area was a real place. Um, the answer is no, but it's based on a real place, and if the weather behind me holds out, I'm going to take you out there in just a few minutes. Uh, the place that it's modeled after is the Buena Vista grasslands here in central Wisconsin. And there is no person by the name of Mary G. Lincoln. However, um, there are some wonderful people who did a lot of work very much like Mary G. Lincoln. Um, Fran Hammerstrom is the person who comes to mind mostly. If you get a chance to read any of Fran's books, she was an absolutely amazing person. And fortunately, I got to, to meet with her and talk with her before she died. She's an absolutely amazing person. I strongly recommend any book that she wrote. Um, she's... She's a tough, gritty old woman, and she'll make you laugh. Mr. Neinfeld wanted to know if the Barons were still in existence or were they developed. And the answer to that is yes. Um, there are a lot of places that are Barons yet. Barons is an ecosystem similar to a prairie or a woods. It's a kind of halfway in between the two. A lot of them have been developed because there weren't a lot of big trees. They make good cornfields. Um, in central Wisconsin here, there are a lot of them that became uh, forests because we stopped wildfire. Um, without fire, barrens and prairies turned into forests. There are some places that still have barrens. Um, if you ever get a chance to be up in northern Wisconsin, there's a place called the Namakagan Barrens. A fantastic place, um, and I strongly recommend it. It's a long drive, but it's a fantastic place. Um, Oscar asks, how come I named the story Restoration in the Barrens? Restoration takes place in the Barrens. It's a story that part of it has to do with um, efforts to understand and keep a place like the, the Barrens a wild place. But it also is about the restoration of a family, about a child's life, and that restoration takes place in and throughout the Barrens. Desiree wanted to know whether I got the idea for the story from Peter Gabriel's Salisbury Hill. First of all, you know, kudos to Desiree for knowing who Peter Gabriel was and knowing the song. Um, it's one of the songs that kept rolling through my head a lot as the writing process was going on. And so it wasn't written about it, but the themes are the same. Inspiration came from it um, on many, many long trips. I had a pen in one hand Peter Gabriel on the CD player and the steering wheel in the other hand. Don't ever drive with a pen in one hand and just you know, don't tell anyone I said that. That's, that's bad. Very, very bad. Don't do that. 
Uh, Charles wanted to know how I got the idea of including a foster child. Um, you know, sometimes teachers talk. And I had known several really wonderful foster parents. And in the course of conversing with a few teachers, I heard some people with some less than accurate ideas about what foster parents were like. The foster parents that I knew were very, very wonderful people. And I wanted to put Corey in a situation where um, I could write about really good, caring, honest um, foster parents. And you know, oddly enough, you know, four, year later, four years later, I became a foster parent myself. Kind of wanted to know if the characters resemble people that I know, and the answer is, yeah, um, in some cases. Not completely, but in some cases you combine character traits of different people, and the odd and interesting parts of one person and the odd and disturbing parts of another person come together and voila, you've got a, you've got a character. Sometimes there's people I know, sometimes there's people, there are people I've read about. Um, sometimes there are certain little things that absolutely um, people who I wrote with them in mind know exactly I'm talking about them. Um, but it's our little secret. Brooklyn wanted to know if, if there was anything I would want to change about my book. Um, the answer is absolutely. Um, every time I read it I think, okay, I could have done that better, the editing process could go this way, I should have done this, what if I did that, would have made more sense if I did this. But sometimes you just got to put it to bed. You got to say, this is done, enjoy it for what it is, move on. So the answer is yes, there are things I would change, but nothing I will change. Um, Caleb wants to know how I get ideas, or how I develop ideas. <clears throat> Caleb asks, when you write books, how do you develop your ideas? Um, well, I'm always writing, and writing takes place in your head, and I'm always jotting down ideas. I always have a notebook, a post-it note, the backside of an envelope always with me. Um, I've gone so far as to leave myself phone messages when a piece of dialogue or some interesting storyline comes comes into play. I clip magazine articles. I do anything that's going to help me build characters, build, um, build scenes. On the next book I'm slowly working on, I uh, have hundreds and hundreds of photographs because I know that there are places and things that I want to include in that and it'll be easier for me to sit and look at the picture and write the descriptions that I need rather than just trying to remember it because as you can see the first thing that goes is your hair after that then your memory so I'm, I'm kind of out of luck on that one. Uh, Brad asks if I've been a part of restoration of native, native habitats or animals like the prairie chicken. And the answer is, yeah, I've been real lucky. I've got to do all kinds of things. Um, the area that you see behind me uh, was cornfield about 15 years ago. It's now where I live, not there, but, you know, here. Uh, and as you will see elsewhere in the video, um, part of my yard, a large part of my yard, is prairie. And just the other day, we lit it up. It's kind of fun. All of that to help restore the prairie grasslands that are here. Um, I've worked with the DNR to help restore um, the sharp-tailed grouse in northern Wisconsin. I've radio tagged elk. I've chased bear around. Um, all kinds of fun opportunities you can have. Uh, I've worked with the people in this area working with the prairie chickens, but not as much as I'd like to. I have to make a living and be a school teacher every now and then. Amber asked how I got an interest in prairies. Well. It's a long story, I'll try to make it short. When I was in college, I got to work for the DNR in a, at a camp where kids got paid to go. We did work, we chopped down trees, we fixed trout streams. Because I was the youngest person there, I got the worst job. I got stuck in the Namakagan Barrens. It was a place that was hot, it was buggy, there were wood ticks, and if there was any shade, you took an ax and cut it down. I didn't understand it. All I knew was I must have been a bad person and got stuck in the barrens. But after an entire summer there, getting to see the place and see it change, it just grabs hold of you. There is nothing as exciting as watching a prairie change from June through August. It's incredible. 
from then on I was changed. There was nothing I could do about it. I was stuck. Um, I was so gung-ho into understanding all of the little idiosyncrasies, the relationships between plants and animals. Just an absolutely wild, fun place to be and no mosquitoes. And that's my favorite. Okay, next question is from Mr. Graysick, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name. With a name like Rita Err, it gets mispronounced all the time also. Um, he asked, do you put music mixes together for your kids and have them guess the themes? Yeah, I do. Um, in fact, I had a music mix that I used to write with about the restoration of the Barrens, and I would play that in the background when the kids were um, doing a variety of things in the classroom and they would start to find the theme and because they were reading the book through an English class they would then be able to kind of see the connection between the science we were doing, the language arts, the English that they were doing with the English teacher and kind of connect it using some of the themes and the music that we put together. Some of it they liked, some of it not so much, but that's, that's everyone's unique personality my tastes are a little bit different than others. Um, Connor writes, if you could write, if you could work with any author, who would it be and why? Uh, probably Carl Hyacinth. I love reading his books. I like his books for kids. I like his books that are maybe a little bit more mature than other kids' books should be. Um, I think he's a fantastic author of novels. I like reading his newspaper articles. I like the fact that uh, he tends to have a, a good, healthy understanding of the place that he works with, whether it's in downtown Miami or the Everglades. And I'd love to spend some time in the Everglades with him. He's also a friend of Jimmy Buffett, and how can that go bad? Uh, Rachel asks if I've been to all the places described in the book. And the answer is yes, I've been to all the places in the book that are real. Some of the places I kind of had to try to make up just a little bit. And here's the reason. I teach at a junior high school in central Wisconsin. It's kind of important that I don't write too closely about the people I work with. I don't want anyone to feel offended, particularly if there's a character that has a, oh, maybe a nasty side like Mr. Kulix. By placing Mr. Kulix and the whole school in a town that doesn't exist, I have a little bit of wiggle room and I can at least pretend I'm not writing about other people. However, every place that's, that's mentioned is either real or based on a real place. The Mary G. Lincoln Wildlife Area, the Buena Vista Grasslands, I will try to get you out there here in a few minutes if the rain holds off. Um, the uh, Rosha Cree, the Tower at Rosha Cree, Again, if the weather cooperates, I'll get you up on top of there. We're supposed to have 60 mile an hour winds tomorrow, so it may hold off a day. Uh, the dams on the um, Wisconsin River where the eagles uh, can congregate, that place at Bitburg is actually a made up location. However, the dams on the Wisconsin River are absolutely fabulous place to see eagles in the wintertime. Um, go there and you can see 30 eagles sitting in trees coming in close. It's just amazing. So all of the places mentioned I've been to or I created based on places that I've been to. Uh, 